different papers, bills, receipts, orders, letters, etc., all in one confused heap, and wishes to restore them to order, what does he do but separate, disconnect, divide, and disunite them, putting each individual kind in an individual place, until all are individualized. If a mechanic goes to his tool chest, and finds all in confusion, what does he do to restore them to order, but disconnect, divide, separate, individualize them, it is within everyone's experience, that when many things of any kind are heterogeneously mixed together, separation, disconnection, division, individuality restores them to order, but no other process will do it. If a multitude of ideas crowd at once upon the mind of a speaker or a writer, what can he do to prevent confusion, but divide his subject, disconnect, disunite its parts, giving to each an individual time and place. It is this which constitutes the principal element of the very highest grade of criticism, as is shown by the foregoing quotations relative to the various appreciations of language, and sentiment, and dress. When two persons are talking at once, there is not sufficient individuality in either voice to separate it from the other. Both uniting together, they make nothing but confusion. The efforts of both them and their auditors are thrown away. The remedy is obviously to disconnect, to individualize them. The more the letters of an alphabet differ from each other, i.e., the more individuality each possesses, the more efficient and perfect are they for the purposes intended. The same is true with regard to arithmetical figures, and everything of this kind. When we mark a number of things for the purpose of distinguishing one from another, we use different marks, but to mark all alike, would only increase the confusion. Phonography a gigantic improvement in letters, which is probably to work a total revolution in literature and book education, consists in individualizing the elements of speech and the signs which represent them, giving to every individual element an individual sign or representative. The same is the case with a mathematical notation of music, published, though unknown to the public. The elements of musical sounds are divided, separated, disunited, each one having its peculiar individual representative on paper, and this alone constitutes the foundation of an improvement for the general diffusion of musical knowledge, and an effective performance, which will probably at some future day make the world wonder at the crudeness and barbarism which, for upward of four hundred years, have been allowed to obscure and conceal the beauties and powers of this most heavenly element of social intercourse, from the mass of mankind. Musical harmony is produced by those sounds only which differ from each other. A continuous reiteration of one note, in all respects the same, has no charms for any one. The beats of a drum, although the same as to tune, are not so as to stress or accent, in this respect they differ, and this difference occurring at regular intervals, the strong contrasted with the weak, enables the attention to dwell upon them, with more or less satisfaction but the unremitted repetition of one dull, unvarying sound would either not command attention or make us run mad. It is when the voice or an instrument sounds different notes, one after the other, that we obtain melody, and it is only when different notes are sounded together that we produce harmony. The keynote, its fifth, its octave, and its tenth, when sounded together, produce a delightful chord, but these are all different from each other and they retain their separate individualities, even while thus associated in the closest possible manner, so that, while all are sounding together, the practiced ear can distinguish either from the others. They never become combined. They never unite into one sound, even in the most complicated, nor in the most enchanting, harmonious associations. If such were the result, if they were to loose their individualities in association, and to unite into one sound, all musical harmony would be unknown, or be suddenly swept from the earth, as social harmony has been by violations of the individualities of man. It is to the indestructible individuality of each note in music that we are indebted for all that we enjoy from this most humanizing art, and it is through a watchful regard to the equally indestructible individualities of man, that he is to be indebted for the harmony of society. Individuality, definiteness, disconnection, division, Disunion is the great principle of social harmony 
order, and progress. The commencement of constitutional governments was the first step of progress in politics, and it was disconnecting, dividing, disuniting the subjects of legislative action from those which were reserved sacred to the people. The disconnection of church and state was a masterstroke for freedom and harmony. The great moving power, the very soul of the Protestant Reformation was, that it left everyone free to interpret the scriptures according to his own individual views. Responsibility must be individual, or there is no responsibility at all. The directing power, or the lead of every movement must be individual, or there is no lead, no order, nothing but confusion. The lead may be a person or a thing, an idea or a principle, but it must be an individuality, or it cannot lead, and those who are led must have an individual or similar impulse, and both that and the lead must coincide or harmonize, to ensure order and progress. The masses in a city, when meeting each other upon the sidewalk, without anything to lead to one individual understanding, may turn out in diverse ways to avoid collision. One turns to the right, the other to the left, and they both counteract each other, and both stop, both change again, with the same result, no progress, nothing can result but uncertainty and confusion, until there is some definite understanding between them, which both cooperate to carry out. Definiteness is attained only by an individuality of meaning in the proposition advanced. Some one individual suggests through the papers that every one turn to the right on meeting another. As it is for the interest, and is the wish of every one to avoid collision and delay, their inclinations and interests coincide with the idea thus thrown out, and the confusion is at an end. Here is individuality of purpose, individuality of understanding, individuality in the regulating or governing power, or lead, and yet the governing power is not a person, but an idea. Therefore, although the lead or governing power must be an individuality, it need not necessarily be a person. It is sufficient that it is an individuality, that is, notwithstanding that thousands accept the suggestion, it has but one meaning to any, and to all, and hence its success as a regulator. But if two suggestions were thrown out at the same time, the one proposing to turn to the right, and the other to the left, and no one individual understanding were arrived at, and if each one had not an interest in avoiding collision, they would neutralize each other, and confusion must be the result. Can we not see, Democrats as we are, that here may be an explanation of the defense of absolutism in governments, for the suppression of diversities of opinion, suppression of the freedom of the press, etc.? Here is in miniature the grand issue between despotism and liberty. What is the solution? I answer, the right of supreme individuality must be accorded to every one, and though it is entirely impracticable to exercise this right in the present close connections and combinations of society, the true business of us all is to invent, modes by which all these connections and amalgamated interests can be individualized, so that each can exercise his right of individuality, at his own cost, without involving or counteracting others, then, that his cooperation must not be required in anything wherein his own inclinations do not concur or harmonize with the object in view. I admit that this makes it necessary that the interests of the individual should harmonize with the public interests. This is entirely impossible upon any principles now known to the public, and this explains the motive for the introduction of these new elements of society. We propose to throw out such ideas or discoveries as, when they come to be examined, may, like any other definite or scientific truths, become like the suggestions relative to the sidewalk, the regulators of the movements of each individual by the coincidence between these suggestions and his interests, or self-preservation. Blackstone, and other theorists, are fatally mistaken when they think they get one general will by a concurrence of vote. Many influences may decide a vote contrary to the feelings and views of the voters, and, more than this, perhaps no two in twenty will understand or appreciate a measure or foresee its consequences alike, even while they are voting for it. There may be 10,000 hidden unconscious diversities among the voters which cannot be made manifest till the measure comes to be put in practice, when, perhaps, 9 out of 10 of the voters will be more or less disappointed, because the result does not coincide with their particular, individual expectations. These inventions are all too short-sighted and too defective to be allowed to govern the great interests of mankind. I admit, that when we have once committed the mistake of getting into too close connections, 
it is impossible for each to exercise his right of individuality, that then, perhaps, to be governed by the wishes of the greatest number, if we could ascertain them, might be the best expedient, but it is only an expedient, a very imperfect one, dangerous when great interests are involved, and positively destructive to the security of person and property, from the uncertainty of the turning of the vote, or of the permanence of the institution resulting from it. One man may turn the whole vote, and often for want of definiteness, individuality, in the meaning of the terms of the laws, their interpretation and administration are, of necessity, left to an individual, and this is despotism. The whole process is like traveling in a circle too large to be taken in at a glance, but yet, without being aware of it, we travel toward the point whence we set out, although we take the first steps in the opposite direction, disconnecting all interests, and allowing each to be absolute despot or sovereign over his own, at his own cost, is the only solution that is worthy of thought. Good thinkers never committed a more fatal mistake than in expecting harmony from an attempt to overcome individuality, and in trying to make a state or a nation an individual. The individuality of each person is perfectly indestructible. A state or a nation is a multitude of indestructible individualities, and cannot, by any possibility, be converted into anything else. The horrid consequences of these monstrous and abortive attempts to overcome simple truth and nature, are displayed on every page of the world's melancholy history. A few instances will illustrate, Lamartine, in his admirable history of the First French Revolution, says, Among the posthumous notes of Robespierre, were found the following, there must be one will, and this will must be either republican or royalist. All diplomacy is impossible as long as we have not unity of power. We here see the very root of his policy and the explanation of his sanguinary career. It was precisely the same root from which have sprung all the ancient as well as modern political and social fallacies. It was a demand for unity. Oneness of mind, oneness of action, where coincidence was impossible. The demand disregarded all nature's individualities, demanded the annihilation of all diversity, and made dissent a crime. Therefore, all were criminal by necessity, for no two had the power to be alike. The true basis for society is exactly the opposite of all this. It is freedom to differ in all things, or the sovereignty of every individual. Having the liberty to differ does not make us differ, but, on the contrary, it is a common ground upon, which all can meet, a particular in which the feelings of all coincide, and is the first true step in social harmony. Giving full latitude to every experiment, at the cost of the experimenters, brings everything to a test, and ensures a harmonious conclusion. Among a multitude of untried routes, only one of which is right, the more liberty there is to differ and take different routes, the sooner will all come to a harmonious conclusion as to the right one, and this is the only possible mode by which the harmonious result aimed at can be attained. Compulsion, even upon the right road, will never be harmonious. The sovereignty or the individual will be found on trial to be indispensable to harmony in every step of social reorganization, and when this is violated or infringed, then that harmony will be sure, to be disturbed. Robespierre may have carried the old idea a little farther than some republicans, but he carried it no farther than the Grecians, the Venetians, and even the ancient and modern advocates of community of property. In all of them, as well as in all forms of organized society, the first and great leading idea was and is, to sink the individual in the state or body politic when nothing short of the very opposite of this, which is, raising every individual above the state above institutions, above systems, above man-made laws, will enable society to take the first successful step toward its harmonious adjustment, too. Lamartine, page 337. Cuthon said, Citizens, Capet is accused of great crimes, and in my opinion he is guilty. Accused, he must be judged, for eternal justice demands that every guilty man shall be condemned. By whom shall he be condemned? by you, whom the nation has constituted the great tribunal of the state. Hero, by a jumble of sounding words, great crimes, eternal justice, great tribunal of the state, all of which mean nothing whatever but the barbarian imagination of the speaker, a phantom got up called the state, 
which is made to absolve the murderers from the responsibility of the murder. If this responsibility had rested individually upon Kuthan, where, in truth, the whole of all that he was talking about existed, he would have shrunk back from taking the first step. But throwing all the responsibility upon the soulless phantom called the state, there was no longer any check to crime. This is raising institutions or the state above the individual. Again, the family of Louis XVI. Being in prison, the municipal guard were always present at all their meals and other meetings, and prevented all confidential conversations, even their private feelings were suppressed, by order of authority. They were ordered not to speak in a low voice, but to talk aloud, and in French, any other language was forbidden. Madame Elizabeth, having once forgotten this order, spoke a few words in a low tone to her brother, the king, when the municipal in authority scolded her violently, and said, The secrets of tyrants are conspiracies against the people, speak out, said he, or be silent, the nation should hear everything. Here again, the nation, the state was everything, the individual nothing. The king, his wife, his amiable sister, and their children had no rights left. The nation, authority, the institution, had annihilated all, and a dying sister must not speak to a dying brother, but their bleeding hearts must be laid bare by heartless authority, and trampled under the feet of the horrid monster of the imagination called, the nation. This is raising the nation above the individual. Human institutions above humanity. The true order is frightfully inverted. The individual should be the all, and the nation should be a multitude of sovereign individuals, or be nothing. Again, page 289. Speaking of Louis XVI, in prison, Lamartine says. The uniformity of this life began to change to custom and peace of mind. The daily presence of beings mutually beloved, his family was with him, their mutual tenderness, more felt since the etiquette of a court no longer opposed the effusion of the sentiments of nature. The free play of the natural family feelings, even to a king in prison, was preferable to the constraint of a court etiquette, which is imposed professedly for the dignity of the state. This again, is sacrificing the individual to the state. Page 483. Robespierre was repudiating the wholesale murders that had disgraced the revolution, Marat felt sore under the responsibility that rested on him, and jumping up, shouted aloud, they were a national vengeance. What would he have done for a scapegoat if the people had not been trained in the dogma of the state everything, the individual nothing? An elderly lady in the country, hearing that her daughter had been thrust into prison the day before, on suspicion of being opposed to the revolution, hastened in dreadful alarm to the city, alighted at a hotel, and in her frenzy of grief, gave vent to some expressions that were immediately interpreted into disapprobation of the revolution. She and her daughter both met at ten o'clock the next day, for the last time in the world, at the guillotine. The revolution had become the all-in-all, -all, humanity was blotted out. The laws, rules, and edicts of the revolution were above all else, the revolution was the great juggernaut, to which it was thought a virtue to procure victims. This is raising institutions above the individual. Page 351. Robespierre himself, in returning in the evening to Duplay's house, and conversing on the sentence just passed upon the king, seemed to protest against the vote of the Duke of Orleans. The miserable man, said he, he was only required to listen to his own heart and make himself an exception. He would not or dare not do so. And why dared not the Duke of Orleans to listen to his own individual heart and make himself an exception? Because the public would not sanction it, they knew nothing of the right of individuality. The institution of the revolution had become everything, the individual nothing, Robespierre said to the National Convention of France. Besides, do you not perceive that by giving up the citizens to the individuality of religion, you kindle the signal of discord in every town and village? Some would have a religion, others would wish for none, and they would thus become mutual objects of contempt and hatred. Why would they have become mutual objects of contempt and hatred? Simply because this individuality was not recognized as the absolute right of every person, and was not known as the great principle of order and harmony. Diversity could only beget enmity where conformity was demanded. 
Robespierre himself lost his own life in an attempt to enforce conformity. Page 309 As the king was conducted to the guillotine, no insult, no imprecation arose from the multitude. If it had been asked of each of these 200,000 citizens, actors, or spectators in this funeral of a living man, must this man, one against all, die, not one would have replied, yes. But circumstances were so combined, by the misfortunes and pressure of the times, that all accomplished, unhesitatingly, what, isolated, no one would have consented to. What plainer evidence do we require to prove that isolated, or individual responsibilities and actions would constitute the true corrective for the enormities that have always been committed under the barbarian notion, that something called the state, or the law, was superior to humanity, or that institutions should rise above the individual, instead of being subordinate and useful to the individual. Page 254 Any other man than Robespierre would have felt the influences of these reminiscences, and a feeling of generous pity would have stolen over his mind. But calculation had superseded all natural feelings in his mind, and the more he stifled every sentiment of humanity, the nearer did he, in his own imagination, approach to superhuman greatness, and the more he endured from the struggle, the more persuaded was he of its justice. Robespierre was all this time only consistently sacrificing everything and every body to the phantom in his imagination called the Republic, the Revolution, or the state. Page 127. Danton, cruel on the whole, but capable of pity in detail, yielded to the solicitations of friendship and the dictates of his own heart, and released, on the previous evening, several persons in whose fate he had felt an interest. Ordering crimes to be committed through the ferocity of system, and not the ferocity of nature, he seemed happy to rescue victims from himself how evidently the system had risen above the man. The idea of the absolute inviolability of every person must lead and predominate in any movement, or it will proceed in confusion and end in despair. Page 140. Kazat was imprisoned separately from his daughter. The judges did what assassins shrank from, and Kazat perished. It was the ferocity of system that made the judges worse than assassins. The ferocity of system commences at the point where it begins to rise above man. Page 160 Louis XVI will lose his head on the scaffold, wrote von Fried to his brothers of Bordeaux. The majority desire it, and liberty and equality demand it as much as universal justice, the sacrifice is great condemn a man to death. My heart revolts at the idea, but duty speaks, and I bid my heart be still. The ferocity of system had deluded Franfried with regard to duty, the right of majorities, and of justice. I understand the first step in justice to be the inviolability of person, whether it be king or beggar. This is also the true foundation of liberty and equality. Political systems, to the contrary, only prove their fallacy and their wickedness. Volume 3, page 288. The Republic was no longer a society, but a massacre of conquered men upon a battlefield. The fury of ideas is more implacable than the fury of men, for men have heart and opinion has none. Systems are brutal forces, which bewail not even that which they crush. As the bullets on a battlefield, they strike without choice without justice, and frustrate the end which was assigned to them. The revolution had belied its doctrine by its tyranny. It stained its right by its violence. It dishonored its struggles by its executions. Nothing can be more true than these comments on the revolution, but what is the root of all this ferocity of system? And what is the remedy? The root is the erecting of systems above men. The state above the individual human laws above humanity. The remedy must be the sovereignty of the individual, at his own cost, preserved through all the ramifications of the social state. 3. Page 243. The horror of living had conquered the horror of death. Young girls and children begged to fall beside their fathers and kinsfolk thus shot down, 
and daily, daily the judges had to refuse the supplications of despair, imploring the penalty of death, less fearful than that of living. Every day they granted or refused these requests. The barbarity of these proconsuls did not await crime, but prejudged it in name, education, or rank. They struck in anticipation of the future. They anticipated years, they immolated infancy for its opinions to come, old age for its past opinions, women for the crimes of tenderness and tears. Mourning was forbidden as under Tiberius. Many were punished for having had a sorrowful countenance or a mourning garb. Nature was distorted into an accusation, and to be pure, it had become necessary to repudiate nature. All virtues were reversed in the human heart. The Jacobinism of the proconsuls of Lyons had overthrown the instincts of men, false patriotism had overthrown humanity. In other and shorter terms, the institutions had overthrown the individual. Volume 3, page 166. The Girondists were removed during the night to their last place of detention, the conciergerie, where the queen was still confined. Thus the same roof covered the fallen queen and the men who hurled her from her throne on the 10th of August. The victim of royalty and the victims of the republic. Both parties brought to the same end from the same Both parties brought to the same end from the same cause. A striking, a melancholy, an impressive lesson to all builders of political or social institutions. It matters not what form a government assumes on paper absolute despotisms, qualified monarchies, republics, or reform combinations, all raise the institutions, or an external power, above the individual, and, consequently, all have their victims in their turn, or, rather, in one form or another, all are victims. The sovereignty of every individual, or raising the individual above all institutions, and all external power or authority, is the only remedy. Page 417. The number and barbarity of the executions, the innocence of the victims, the distribution of the spoil, the derision of judgment, the streams of blood, and the heaps of corpses, had transformed the nation into an executioner and the government into a machine of murder. Whoever studies this era in the world's sad history, as a lesson to mankind, will see that no other result could possibly have been attained after having once annihilated all respect to the right of individuality and made the state policy the all in all. From this one great grand error have all organized societies of men and women been victimized, in one form or another. All social calculations have been frustrated, and, up to this moment, anarchy, confusion, and suffering pervades the earth. By this first false step men's minds have become inver inverted, and all men's political and social relations are correspondingly deranged. The state, the society, the institutions, the body politic, the nation, the system, or customs we live in, must not be permitted to become primary, but must be secondary. Neither man, nor man-made laws or systems, must rise above man, but laws, rules, and institutions, must be subject to man's purposes. Human institutions must not rise above humanity, man must not be distorted to fit institutions but institutions must be made to fit man. The state, or body politic, must result from individuality, instead of crushing it. If we would have a prosperous state, it must result from the prosperity of the individuals who compose the state. Where every individual is rich, the state will be rich. Where every individual is secure in his person and property, the nation, or state, is secure. Where every individual thrives, there will be a thriving state or nation. Where every individual should do justice, their justice would reign in the state or nation. Where every individual should be free, there would be a free state or a free nation. The liberty, freedom, freedom or sovereignty of a state or nation, must consist of the sovereignty of the individuals who compose the state or nation. But there never was a prosperous nation where every individual languished. No rich nation, where the property of all its members was consumed in building up national glory. 
A state or nation cannot be secure in person and property, where the person and property of every individual is under institutions which are liable to unforeseen changes. There can be no just state or nation, where every individual is ignorant or indifferent to what constitutes justice. There can be no free state or nation, where every individual lives under, instead of above, the customs, laws, and institutions of the state or nation. An illustration of individuality, as the great principle of order, is seen in any movement of much magnitude, which must, of necessity, embrace a great number of parts. A large post office is divided into different departments, each department having an individual place. There is a place for delivery, a place for deposit, a place for females, a place for males, a place for newspapers, a place for unadvertised letters, and a place for letters that have been advertised. Some of these departments are again subdivided, or individualized. The advertised letters are placed under different alphabetical heads, and different places of delivery are established for one kind of letters, to avoid the confusion of too much mixture. The perfection would be dividing. parts until they were indivisible, in other words, the perfection of order would consist of perfect individuality. Another illustration is seen in an army. The commander-in-chief is the individual leader of the whole. Other officers under him, each have the lead of a particular individualized portion of the body. Each of these portions is again divided, and an individual has the particular lead of each of these most minute subdivisions. All these different leads coincide with each other. All this is a beautiful development of order, without which nothing could be accomplished. Only one more step is in the same direction wanting. And this is, that the lead which each individual subordinate or soldier has by nature within him, should coincide or harmonize with all the other leads, as in the post, office, or else, that he should not be required to act. If this would present a check to action, it would check only vicious action and furnish the only commander would then be changed into the word leader. Corrective for that vulgar and criminal ambition that has so uniformly desolated and cursed the world. The word commander would then be changed into the word leader. Lamartine, in his History of Dot the French Revolution, Volume 2, page 370, says that Lilienhorn, one of the conspiring assassins of Gustavus, King of Sweden, confessed that he was seduced into the crime by the ambition of commanding the National Guard during the tumult that would be likely to follow the king's death. The eclat attached to commanders, heroes, etc., is the result of ignorance relative to their merits. A whole army of commanders-in-chief could do nothing if there were more than one commander-in-chief. It makes not so much difference who is leader. Great results are attained not so much because this or that person is leader, but because there is individuality in the lead. Every person is an individual, and therefore possesses the essential qualification for a leader. It is individuality, therefore, that is entitled to the eclat rather than the person who happens to become the agent to act it out. Now, if this had been generally known, Lilienhorn would not have conspired against the life of Gustavus, for the prospect of the eclat of commanding the National Guard, Gustavus, a peaceful and philosophical friend of justice, might not have been assassinated, his influence might have modified the conduct of the surrounding powers, and the frightful catastrophe of the revolution might have been averted. Such are the magnificent tendencies of a knowledge of individuality, and nature, true to her great purpose, the elevation and perfection of the race, is, and always has been, silently, though irresistibly at work, counteracting the blunders of her children, dividing and subdividing political parties, religious sects, and all national, state, and social combinations, and dragging them through with their faces stubbornly averted, toward the true harmonious, peaceful, prosperous, happy condition of ultimate individuality. Nothing is more common than the remark that, no two persons are, nothing is more common than the remark that, no two
Nothing is more common than the remark that, no two persons are alike, that, circumstances alter cases, that, we must agree to disagree, etc., and yet we are constantly forming institutions that require us to be alike, which make no allowance for the individuality of persons or circumstances, and which render it necessary for us to agree, and leave us no liberty to differ from each other, nor to modify our conduct according to circumstances. To everything there is a season, and time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Such is the individuality of times. There is an individuality of countenance, stature, gait, voice, which characterize every one, and each of these peculiarities is inseparable from the person, he has no power to divest himself of them, they constitute parts of his physical individuality, and were it not so, the most inconceivable confusion would derange all our social intercourse. Every one would be liable to the same name. One man would be mistaken for another. Our relations and friends would be strangers to us. No security of person, of possessions. No justice between men. No distinction between friends or foes. All would be mere guesswork or chance, and universal confusion would reign triumphant. How much, then, are we indebted to individuality, even in these four particulars of physical conformation? The fact, that these peculiarities of each are inseparable from each, not to be conquered, not to be divided or separated from each, is apparently the only part of social order that man, in his had career of policy and expediency, has not overthrown or smothered. I have spoken of only four of the peculiarities of human character, and if these confer such benefits upon society, what may we not expect on a full development of all the capacities, physical, mental, and moral? with which every one is, to a greater or less extent, invested. But no two alike, and if the little intellectual development now extant results in an individuality that makes men and women restive and ungovernable, under the existing institutions, what are we to expect for the future? Not only are no two minds alike now, but no one remains the same from one hour to another. Old impressions are becoming obliterated, new ones being made, new combinations of old thoughts constantly being formed, and old combinations exploded. The surrounding atmosphere, the contact of various persons and circumstances, all contribute to make us more the mirrors of passing things than the possessors of any fixed character, and we have no power to be otherwise, therefore, to require us to be stationary blocks, all of one size, hewn out by laws, institutions, or customs, is a monstrous piece of injustice, and it is impossible in the very nature of things. I have seen a youth, who, from habitual inclination, rejected meat as an article of food, in one minute converted into, as it were, a ravenous wolf. He jumped at, and seized a raw chicken, tore a piece from its leg with his teeth, and chewed it with a voracity truly frightful, but while in the very act, in less than a second, he suddenly stopped and sickened at what he had done. All this was effected by the direction of electronervous currents upon different parts of the brain by artificial means wink with a frown for. But we are apparently surrounded with this fluid at all times, and we cannot say beforehand what effects it shall produce upon us. Where, now, is the right in pledging ourselves to be consistently of this or that character? And where the right in others to demand of us to conform to their modes of thought or action? And where is the authority for human institutions to rise above humanity, and say, with the tone of command, Be ye this, or, Be ye that? Thus far shalt thou go, and no farther? I saw a youth in a co company of twenty-three persons, selected for his known scrupulous regard to the rights of property, in one minute and a half converted into a daring thief.
He stole money purposely laid in his He stole money purposely laid in his way before the eyes of the whole company, hid the money, and then denied it with the boldness and assurance of a hardened professor. In a second he was made extremely conscientious, and sunk down with grief, shame, remorse, as if he would have gladly hidden himself from himself and all the world in the very depths of the grave, and our most soothing efforts were necessary for his relief, assuring him that it was all our work. The scene was extremely affecting. There was scarcely a dry eye in the company, and the exclamation was made, Oh God! That lawmakers could only get the lesson that we have had tonight. To what purpose, O oh legislators, do ye say, Thou shalt not steal? To what end are all your horrid inventions for punishment? Stealing still goes on, and ye only repeat, Thou shalt not steal, and still punish, even though you said at first that punishment was a remedy. Ye have no remedy. But only inflict tenfold more evils by your abortive attempts to overcome effects without consulting causes, or opening your eyes and ears to explanations. Our security against fire and gunpowder is in our knowledge of their natures and their incalculable modes of action, which knowledge raises us above their dangers, and renders them useful and comparatively harmless. Our remedies and securities against social evils are in our knowledge of our own natures, our inevitable modes of action, our true positions with regard to each other, and to our institutions. Even man-made laws, rules, precepts, dogmas, counsel, advice, may all be rendered comparatively harmless and useful by not allowing them to rise above the higher law, the them to rise above the higher law, the highest utility, the sovereignty of the individual. We are liable to be deceived and disappointed in ourselves, as well as in others, until we are aware of this liabil liability, which raises us above the danger, and we are subject, not only to constant changes, but to actions and temporary reactions, over which, at the time, we have no control whatever. The intrinsic philosophy of reactions may be beyond our reach, but the facts are notorious, that the reaction of fatigue of mind or body is rest, that the reaction of intense friendship is intense enmity, the reaction of intense love is indifference, a temporary or intense hatred, the reaction of great benevolence is temporary malevolence, the reaction of philanthropy is misanthropy, the reaction of great hope or expectations is temporary or great despair, the reaction of great popularity is sudden unpopularity, and it is well known that the greatest benefactors of the race, from high popularity, have often suddenly fallen victims to an unaccountable public hatred. It is also notorious that all of us are liable to strange inconsistency and are therefore false. And the great problem It is also notorious that all of us are liable to strange inconsistencies of character and that no effort on our part can prevent it, that the most reasonable are sometimes very unreasonable, the most accurate observers are very often under mistake, the most consistent are sometimes inconsistent, the most wise are sometimes foolish, the most rational sometimes insane. How unreasonable, then, how inconsistent, how unwise, how absurd, to promise for ourselves, or to demand of others, always to be reasonable, correct, consistent, and wise. Under all these changes, and actions, and reactions, and inconsistencies of character, over which, at the time, we have no control whatever. How difficult to regulate ourselves. How impossible to govern others. Add to all these unavoidable idiosyncrasies add to all these unavoidable idiosyncrasies of character, the nice and peculiar influences of the conditions of the vital organs, the circulation of the blood, the influence of intangible agents, all combining and acting differently, perhaps, on every different constitution, and like the changes of the kaleidoscope, seldom or never twice alike, even upon the same individual. 
Add these again to what has been said in the foregoing pages, and to all that passes in our daily experience, bearing directly upon the point under consideration, and we shall then get only a glimpse of individuality, then consider on what foundation rest all customs laws, and institutions which demand conformity. They are all directly opposed to this inevitable individuality, and are therefore false. And the great problem must be solved with the broadest admission of the absolute right of supreme individuality. The exercise of this right being impracticable in combined or amalgamated interests and responsibilities, universal harmony demands that those be universally disintegrated, individualized. I, the proper, legitimate, just reward of labor. With regard to the first proposition, marked I, the reward of labor, it is. Perhaps, scarcely necessary to add anything to what has been said within the last twenty years on this subject. It is now evident to all eyes, that labor does not obtain its legitimate reward, but on the contrary, that those who work the hardest, fare the worst. The most elegant and costly houses, coaches, clothing, food, and luxuries of all kinds are in the hands of those who never made either of them, nor ever did any useful thing for themselves or for society while those who made all, and maintain themselves at the same time, are shivering in miserable homes, or pining in prisons or poor houses, or starving in the streets. Machinery has thrown workmen out of their tenth paid employment, and this machinery is also owned by those who never made it, nor gave any equivalent in their own labor for it. These, star these starving workmen have no resource but upon the soil, but they find that this also is under the control of those who never made it, nor ever did anything as an equivalent for it. At this point of starvation, we must have remedy, or confusion. At this point, society must attend to the rights of labor, and settle, once for all, the great problem of its just reward. This appears to demand a discrimination, a disconnection, a disunion between cost and value. If a traveler, in a hot day, stop at a farmhouse, and ask for a drink of water, he generally gets it without any thought of price. Why? Because it costs nothing, or its cost is immaterial. If the traveler was so thirsty that he would give a dollar for the water, rather than not have it, this would be the value of the water to him, and if the farmer were to charge this price, he would be acting upon the principle that, the price of a thing should be what it will bring, which is the motto and spirit of all the principal commerce of the world, and if he were to stop up all the neighboring springs, and cut of all supplies of water from other sources, and compel travelers to depend solely on him for water, and then should charge them a hundred dollars for a drink, he would be acting precisely upon the principle on which all the main business of the world has been conducted from time immemorial. It is pricing a thing according to what it will bring, or according to its value, to the receiver, instead of its cost to the producer. For an illustration in the mercantile line, consult any report of prices current, or state of the markets, with comments by the publisher. The following is a sample, copied from a paper, the nearest at hand. No new arrivals of flour, demand increasing, prices rose since yesterday, at 12 o'clock, 25 CTS per barrel. No change in coffee since our last. Sugar raised on Thursday, half CT per pound, in consequence of a report received of short crops, but later arrivals contradicted the report and prices fell again. Molasses, in demand, and holders not anxious to sell. Pork, little in market, and prices rising. Bacon, plenty and dull, fell since our last, from 15 to 13 cents. Cotton, all in few hands, bought up on speculation. It will here be seen, that prices are raised in consequence of increased want, and are lowered with its decrease. The most successful speculator is he who can create the most want in the community, and extort the most from it. This is civilized cannibalism. The value of a loaf of bread to a starving man, is equivalent to the value of his life, and if the price of a thing, should be, what it will bring, then one might properly demand of the starving man, his whole future life in servitude as the price of the loaf. But, anyone who should make such a demand, would be looked upon as insane, a cannibal, 
and one simultaneous voice would denounce the outrageous injustice and cry aloud for retribution. Why? What is it that constitutes the cannibalism in this case? Is it not setting a price upon the bread according to its value instead of its cost? If the producers and vendors of the bread had bestowed one hour's labor upon its production and in passing it to the starving man, then some other articles which cost its producer and vendor an hour's equivalent labor would be a natural and just compensation for the loaf. I have placed emphasis on the idea of equivalent labor because it appears that we must discriminate between different kinds of labor, some being more disagreeable, more repugnant, requiring a more costly draft upon our ease or health than others. The idea of cost extends to and embraces this difference. The most repugnant labor being considered the most costly. The idea of cost is also extended to all contingent expenses in production or vending. A watch has a cost and a value. The cost consists of the amount of labor bestowed on the mineral or natural wealth in converting it into metal, the labor bestowed by the workman in constructing the watch, the wear of tools, the rent, firewood, insurance, taxes, clerkship, and various other contingent expenses of its manufacturer, together with the labor expended in its transmission from him to its vendor, and the labor and contingent expenses of the vendor in passing it to the one who uses it. In some of these departments the labor is more disagreeable or more deleterious to health than in others, but all these items, or more, constitute the costs of the watch. The value of a well-made watch depends upon the natural qualities of the metals or minerals employed, upon the natural qualities or principles of its mechanism, upon the uses to which it is applied, and upon the fancy or wants of the purchaser. It would be different with every different watch, with every purchaser, and would change every day in the hands of the same purchaser, and with every different use to which he applied it. Now, among this multitude of values, which one should be selected to set a price upon? Or, should the price be made to vary and fluctuate according to these fluctuating values? And never be completely sold, five, but only from hour to hour? Common sense answers neither, but, that these values, like those of sunshine and air, are of right, the equal property of all, no one having a right to set any price whatever upon them. Cost, then, is the only rational ground of price, even in the most complicated transactions, yet, value is made almost entirely the governing principle in almost all the commerce of what is called civilized society. One may inform another that his house is on fire. The information may be of great value to him and his family, but as it costs nothing, there is no ground of price. Conversation, and all other intercourse of mind with mind, by which each may be infinitely benefited, may prove of inconceivable value to all, where the cost is nothing, or too trifling to notice, it constitutes what is here distinguished as purely intellectual commerce. The performance of a piece of music for the gratification of oneself and others, in which the performer feels pleasure but no pain, and which is attended with no contingent cost, may be said to cost nothing, there is, therefore, no ground of price. It may, however, be of great value to all within hearing. This intercourse of the feelings, which is not addressed to the intellect, and has no pecuniary feature, is here distinguished as our moral commerce. A word of sympathy to the distressed may be of great value to them, and to make this value the ground and limit of a price, would be but to follow out the principle that a thing should bring its value. Mercenary as we are, even now, this is nowhere done except by the priesthood. A man has a lawsuit pending, upon which hangs his property, his security, his personal liberty, or his life. The lawyer who undertakes his case may ask ten, twenty, fifty, five hundred, or five thousand dollars, for a few hours attendance or labor in the case. This charge would be based chiefly on the value of his services to his client. Now, there is nothing in this statement that sounds wrong, but it is because our ears are familiarized with wrong. The case is similar to that of the starving man. The cost to the lawyer might be, say 20 hours labor, and allowing a portion for his apprenticeship, say 21 hours in all, with all contingent expenses, would constitute a legitimate, a just ground of price, 
but the very next step beyond this rests upon value, and is the first step in cannibalism. The laborer, when he comes to dig the lawyer's cellar, never thinks of setting a price upon its future value. To the owner, he only considers how long it will take him, how hard the ground is, what will be the weather to which he will be exposed, what will be the wear and tear of teams, tools, clothes, etc., and in all these items, he considers nothing but the different items of cost to himself. The doctor demands of the woodcutter the proceeds of five, ten, or twenty days' labor for a visit of an hour, and asks, in excuse, if the sick man would not prefer this rather than continuous disease or death. This, again, is basing a price or an assumed value of his attendance instead of its cost. It is common to plead the difference of talents required, without waiting to prove this plea false, it is, perhaps, sufficient to show that the talents required, either in cutting wood, or in cutting off a leg or an arm, so far as they cost the possessor, are a legitimate ground of estimate and of price, but talents which cost nothing, are natural wealth, and like the water, land, and sunshine, should be accessible to all without price. If a priest is required to get a soul out of purgatory, he sets his price according to the value which the relatives set upon his prayers, instead of their cost to the priest. This, again, is cannibalism. The same amount of labor equally disagreeable, with equal wear and tear, performed by his customers, would be a just remuneration. All patents give to the inventor or discoverer the power to command a price based upon the value of the thing patented instead of which, his legitimate compensation would be an equivalent for the cost of his physical and mental labor, added to that of his materials, and the contingent expenses of experiments. A speculator buys a piece, inland of government, for $1.25 per acre, and holds it till surrounding improvements, made by others, increase its value, and it is then sold accordingly, for 5, 10, 20, 100, or $10,000 per acre. From this operation of civilized cannibalism whole families live from generation to generation, in idleness and luxury, upon the surrounding population, who must have the land at any price. Instead of this, the prime cost of land, the taxes, and other contingent expenses of surveying, etc., added to the labor of making contracts, would constitute the equitable price of land purchased for sale. If a purchases a lot for his own use, and B wants it more than A, then A may properly consider what his labor upon it has cost him, and what would compensate him for the inconvenience or cost of parting with it, but this is a very different thing from purchasing it on purpose to part with it, which costs a no inconvenience. We here discriminate between these two cases, but in neither do we go beyond cost as the limit of price. A loan's to be $10,000 at 6%, interest, for one year and at the end of the year receives back the whole amount loaned and $600 more. For what? For the use of the money. Why? Because it was of that valve to the borrower. For the same reason, why not demand of the starving man $10,000 for a loaf of bread because it saves his life? The legitimate, the equitable compensation for the loan of money, is the cost of labor in lending it and receiving it back again. Rents of land, buildings, etc., especially in cities, are based chiefly on their value to the occupants, and this depends on the degree of want or distress felt by the landless and houseless, the greater the distress, the higher the value and the price. The equitable rent of either would be the wear, insurance, etc., and the labor of making contracts and receiving the rents, all of which are different items of cost. The products of machinery are now sold for what they will bring, and therefore its advantages go exclusively into the pockets of its owners. If these products were priced at the cost of the machinery, its wear, attendance, etc., then capitalists would not be interested in its introduction any more than those who attended it, they would not be interested in reducing the wages of its attendants, and in proportion as it threw workmen out of employment it would work for them. One of the most common, most disgusting features of this iniquitous spirit of the present pecuniary commerce, is seen and felt by everyone, in all the operations of buying and selling. The cheating, higgling, huckstering, and falsehoods, so degrading to both purchaser and vendor, 
and the injustice done to one party or the other, in almost every transaction in trade, all originate in the chaotic union of cost, value, and the reward of labor of the vendor all into one price. To bring order out of this confusion, to put a stop to the discord and degradation of trade, and to reward the distributor of goods without invading the property of the purchaser, there is probably no other way than to discriminate between the cost and the value of the goods, and between the cost of the goods and the cost of the labor of buying and selling them, keeping these disconnected, individualized. A storekeeper selling a needle, cannot get paid for his labor within the price of the needle, to do this he must disconnect the two, and make the needle one item of the charge, and his labor another. If he sell the needle for its prime cost, and its portion of contingent expenses, and charge an equal amount of labor for that which he bestows in purchasing and vending, he is equitably remunerated for his labor, and his customer's equal right is not invaded. Again, he cannot connect his remuneration with a larger article with any more certainty of doing justice to himself or his customer. If he add three cents upon each yard of calico, as his compensation, his customers may take one yard, and he does not get an equivalent for his labor. If the customer take 30 yards, he becomes overpaid, and his customer is wronged. Disconnection of the two elements of price, and making cost the limit of each, works seven equitably for both parties in all cases, and at once puts an end to the higgling, the deception, frauds, and every other disgusting and degrading feature of our pecuniary commerce. An importer of foreign goods writes a letter to a foreign correspondent for goods to the amount of $20,000. On their arrival, if he sell them for what they will bring, perhaps he gets $40,000 for them, which may be about $18,000 over and above the prime cost and contingent expenses, which he obtains for, perhaps, 8 or 10 hours labor in merchandising, which is about 36,000 times as much as the hardest working man obtains for the same time. With this sum he could obtain 144,000 times an equivalent from females at 12 and a half cents a day, or that of 288,000 children at 61 cents a day. In equitable commerce the expenses of importation, insurance, etc., etc., and those of vending, would be added to prime cost, all of which would constitute ultimate cost, which would also constitute their price. The labor of importing and vending would be paid in an equal amount of labor, so that if the importer employed 10 hours in corresponding with the foreign merchant and receiving the goods, then he would get, upon equitable principles, 10 hours of some other labor, which was equally costly to the performer of it. If scraping the streets were doubly as costly to comfort, clothing, tools, etc., the importer of foreign goods would get 5 hours of this labor for 10 of his own. This would constitute the equitable reward of labor to both parties. Cost being made the limit of price, thus works out the first proposition of our problem, the equitable reward of labor. Legislators. Framers of social institutions. Behold your most fatal. 2. Security of person and property. Fatal error. You have sanctioned value instead of cost as the basis. Fatal error. You have sanctioned value instead of cost as the basis of your institutions. Behold, also, the origin of rich and poor. The fatal pitfall of the working classes. The great political blunder. The deep seated, unseen germ of the confusion, insecurity, and iniquity of the world. The mildew, the all pervading poison of the social condition. 2. Security of person and property. Theorists have told us that laws and governments are made for the security of person and property, but it must be evident to most minds that they never have, never will accomplish this professed object. Although they have had all the world at their control for thousands of years, they have brought it to a worse condition than that in which they found it, in spite of the immense improvements in mechanism, division of labor and other elements of civilization to aid them. On the contrary, under the plausible pretext of securing person and property, they have spread wholesale destruction, famine, and wretchedness, in every frightful form over all parts of the earth, where peace and security might other otherwise have prevailed. Have prevailed. They have prevailed. They have shed more blood, committed more murders,
prevailed. They have shed more blood, committed more murders, tortures, and other frightful crimes in the struggles against each other for the privilege of governing, than society ever would or could have suffered in the total absence of all governments whatever. It is impossible for anyone who can read the history of governments, and the operations of laws, to feel secure in person and property under any form of government, or any code of laws whatever. They invade the private household, they impertinently meddle with, and in their blind and besotted wantonness, presume to regulate the most sacred individual feelings. No feelings of security, no happiness can exist in the governed under such circumstances. They set up rules or laws to which they require conformity, while conformity is impossible, and while neither rulers nor ruled can tell how the laws will be interpreted or administered. Under such circumstances, no security for the governed can exist. A citizen may be suddenly hurried away from his home and despairing family, shut up in a horrid prison, charged with a crime of which he is totally innocent, he may die in prison or on the gallows, and his family may die of mortification and broken hearts. No security can exist where this can happen, yet, all these are the operations of laws and governments, which are professedly instituted for the security of person and property. A young girl is knocked down and violated in the country where law secures person and property. She applies to law for redress, and is put in prison and kept there for six months as a witness, to appear against her violator, who is running at large, forfeits his bonds, and disappears before his victim is restored to liberty in laws and governments are instituted for securing the rights of person and property. A woman is abandoned by a worthless husband, and reduced to the necessity of permitting a villain to board with her a year without any remuneration. He has consumed her last loaf, she appeals to the law for redress, the villain brings the drunken husband into court. The law, for the protection of person and property, forbids the woman to apply for redress while her husband is living, though drunk. Her appeal is suppressed, she is non-suited and put in prison to pay the cost of her protection. Laws and governments are instituted for the protection of person and property. Rulers claim a right to rise above and control the individual, his labor, his trade, his time, and his property, against his own judgment and inclination, while security of person and property cannot consist in anything, less than having the supreme government of himself and all his own interests, therefore, security cannot exist under any government whatever. Governments involve the citizen in national and state responsibilities from which he would choose to be exempt, under these circumstances he can feel no security for person or property. They can compel him to desert his family, and risk or lay down his life in wars in which he feels no wish to engage, they leave him no choice, no freedom of action upon those very points where his most vital interests, his deepest sympathies are at stake. He can feel no security under governments. Great crimes are committed by the government of one nation against another, to gratify the ambition or lust of rulers, the people of both nations are thus set to destroy the persons and property of each other, and would be martyred as traitors if they refused. This is the security of person and property afforded by governments. The accomplished, the intelligent, the beautiful and amiable and askew, could be seized The accomplished, the intelligent, the beautiful and amiable and askew, could be seized in her bed by the ruffian emissaries of the law, and dragged in the dead of the night to torture, her delicate limbs torn asunder, her slender bones broken and she rendered unable to walk, but carried to the place of execution, and burned alive, for not believing a point of religion prescribed by law. Say not that these things have passed away with the reign of Henry VIII. Of England. The spirit is here at work now in our midst, in democratic America, in the year 1846. Some of our best citizens are torn from their families and friends and thrust into loathsome prisons, for not believing in a point of religion prescribed by law, another, for working in the field on a day set apart by law for idleness. One case of this kind is sufficient to show that no security exists for the governed. But the greatest chance for it is with those who can get possession of the governing power, 
Hence arises the universal scramble for the possession of power, as the preferable of the two conditions. These struggles and intrigues for power increase a thousandfold the insecurity of all parties. Rulers kill the members of society as punishment for offenses, instead of tracing these offenses to their own operations, and their pernicious example and prescriptions becoming authority for the uniformed, prompt them to kill their neighbors for an offense, to become their brother for an offense, to become their brother's judge or their neighbor's keeper, and crimination and recrimination, and slander, wrangling, discord, and murder, are the natural fruits of these laws for the security of person and property. No security for peace, harmony, or reputation, for person or property, can exist in such society. If B has done what law forbids, although it be the preservation of a fellow creature, he is insecure while there are witnesses who may appear against him, and all these are insecure as long as B feels insecure. A large portion of all the murders committed since the invention of laws have been perpetrated to silence witnesses. The murderers are, in their turn, murdered by law, and thus crimes increase and continue, originating in the insecurity produced by laws for securing person and property. Again, words are the tenure by which everything is held by law and words are subject to different interpretations, according to the views, wills, or interests of the judges, lawyers, juries, and other functionaries appointed to execute these laws. In this uncertainty of interpretation lies the great fundamental element of insecurity which is inseparable from any system of laws, any constitution, articles of compact, and everything of this description. No language is fit for any such purposes that admits of more than one individual interpretation, and none can be made to possess this necessary individuality, therefore no language is fit for the basis of positive institutions. To possess the interpreting power of verbal power of verbal institutions is to possess unlimited power. It is not generally known, or practically admitted, that each individual is liable, and, therefore, has a right, to interpret language according to his peculiar individuality. That a creed, a constitution, laws, articles of association, are all liable to as many different interpretations as there are parties to it, that each one reads it through his own particular mental spectacles, and that which is blue to one is yellow to another, and green to a third that although all give their assent to the words, each one gives his assent to his peculiar interpretation of them, which is only known to himself, so that the difference between them can be made to appear only in action, which, as soon as it commenced, explodes the discordant elements in every direction, always disappointing the expectations of all who had calculated on uniformity or conformity. Every attempt at amendment only produces new disappointments. But how, you ask, can this be? where each is a member of the body and increases the necessity for other amendments and additions without end, all to end in disappointment and the greater insecurity of every one engaged in or trusting to them. To be harmonious and successful we must begin anew, we must disconnect, disunite ourselves from all institutions based on language or rise above them. Every one must feel that he is the supreme arbiter of his own, that no power on earth shall rise above him, that he is, and always shall be, sovereign of himself, and all that constitutes or is necessarily connected with his individuality. Let every one feel this, and they will feel that which man has always yearned and panted for, but has never realized in society, security of person and property. It is not generally known, or practically ad it is not generally known, or practically ad it is not generally known, or practically admitted, that each individual is li liable, and, therefore, has a right, to interpret language according to his peculiar individuality. That a creed, a constitution, laws, articles of association, are all liable to as many different interpretations as there are parties to it, that each one reads it through his own particular mental spectacles, and that which is blue to one is yellow to another, and green to a third, that although all give their assent to the words, each one gives his assent to his peculiar interpretation of them, which is only known to himself so that the difference between them can be made to appear only in action, which, as soon as it commenced, explodes the discordant elements in every direction, 
always disappointing the expectations of all who had calculated on uniformity or conformity. Every attempt at amendment only produces new disappointments, and increases the necessity for other amendments and, and additions without end, all to end in disappointment and the greater insecurity of every one engaged in or trusting to them. To be harmonious and successful we must begin anew, we must disconnect, disunite ourselves from all institutions based on language or rise above them. Every one must feel that he is the supreme arbiter of his own, that no power on earth shall rise above him, that he is, and always shall be, sovereign of himself, and all that constitutes or is necessarily connected with his individuality. Let every one feel this, and they will feel that which man has always yearned and panted for, but has never realized in society, security of person and property. But how, you ask, can this be, where each is a member of the body politic, where obedience to some law or government is indispensable to the working of the political machine? If everyone was the law unto himself, all would be perfect anarchy and confusion. No doubt of this. The error lies farther back than you have contemplated, it lies in each one being a member of a body politic. We should be no such thing as a body politic. Each man and woman must be an individual, no member of any body but that of the human family. What is the use or origin of a body politic? Blackstone, the father of English and American law, says, It is the wants and the fears of individuals which make them congregate together, and form society, in other words, it is for the interchange of mutual assistance, and for security of person and property, that society is originally formed. Now, if neither of these objects has ever been attained in society, and if we can show the means of attaining them, otherwise we have no reason for keeping up a body politic. With regard to economy and the supply of our wants, this will be treated of in its proper place. With regard to security, we see that in the wide range of the world's bloody history, these is not any one horrid feature so frightful, so appalling, as the recklessness, the cold-blooded indifference with which laws and governments have sacrificed person and property in their wanton, their criminal, or ignorant pursuit of some blind passion, or unsubstantial phantom of the imagination. We have not the space, nor is it necessary, to enter into details, let the reader refer, to any page of history, let him remember that laws and governments are professedly instituted for the security of person and property, property, and let him consider each page an illustration of their success, then he will be able to appreciate a proposal to secure them by some other means. The following is only an illustration. Lamartine in his History of the First French Revolution, says, The bombardment of Mayence commenced with 300 pieces of cannon. The mills which furnished flour were set on fire, meat, as well as bread, was wanting, horses, dogs, oats, and mice were favored by the inhabitants. Pitiless famine compelled the generals to send from the town all useless mouths. Old men, women, and children were driven from its bosom, to the number of two or three thousand, who were equally repulsed by the Prussians, and expired between the two armies, under the cannon of the batteries or in the agonies of hunger. Is it not time to seek security by some other means than by the workings of government? Theorists say that governments are established for the security of person and property, but there is another reason for their existence of a more tangible character. It is the transaction of the business of any combination. In order to dispense with governments, then, we have to withdraw all business out of combinations. To individualize, to disunite all interests, all responsibilities then, and not till then, can we dispense with governments, then, and not till then, will person and property be secure, and society be harmonious. While one's person, his time, his labor, his clothing, his lodging, the education and destinies of his children, are all locked up in national, state, county, township, or reform combinations, and all subject to be controlled by others who may differ from him, it is impossible for him to know security of person or property.
The security of person and property requires exemption from the fear of encroachments from any quarter, and, although governments have always been the greatest depredators upon the rights of persons and property, yet, there are other sources of insecurity, which call for remedy, and which demand, the operation of the cost principle supplies. It will be seen, upon reflection, that value being inequitiously made the basis of price produces all the ruinous fluctuations in trade, the uncertainty of business, the uncertainty of the reward of industry, and the inade inadequacy of its reward, it produces poverty, and the fear of poverty, avarice, and the all-absorbing pursuit of property, without regard to the rights or sympathy for the sufferings of others, and trains us, in the absence of all knowledge or rule of right, mutually to encroach upon and invade each other, all of which, including the encroachments of governments, give rise to the insecurity of person and property. Cost being made the limit of price, would put a stop to all fluctuations in prices and in trade, would enable each one to know, from year to year, the price of everything, would put a stop to every species of speculation, compel everyone to produce as much as he consumed, would distribute the burthen of labor among all, and reduce the amount of labor of each, to one, two, or three hours per day, would raise every one above the temptation to invade another, and every one would, consequently, feel secure. From any encroachments, governments and laws would not then be thought necessary, in order to restrain men from encroaching on each other, and this excuse for their existence would be swept away. Then if all business, all interests were withdrawn out of national, state, church, and all other combinations, and made the care and business of individuals, the demand for public agents or officers would be done away, and no excuse for governments or laws would remain. The power now delegated to them would, would thus be restored back to each individual, who would possess his natural liberty or sovereignty, which principle, together with the rights of labor and property, being clearly defined and admitted by public opinion, would be habitually respected by all, each being raised above any temptation to violate the admitted rights of person or property. When every one shall have an interest in the preservation of each, then the troubled waters will, have become calmed, downtrodden humanity will stand erect upon ground as level as nature makes it, every one can then, sit under his own vine and fig tree, and there will be none to make them afraid and man, will realize what man has never seen, and that which man shall never otherwise know, security of person and property.